Uh, tonight we're going to welcome Guy Riffler, who is the Chair of Civil Engineering at, at Ohio University. Uh, he got his PhD at the University of Connecticut. Uh, his research areas uh, include acid mine drainage treatment, stormwater treatment, uh, algae cultivation for biofuels, and in-house nutrient cycling. Uh, he's also got interests in soccer, backpacking, skiing, and uh, triathlon. So he's obviously an active person. Uh, today he's going to be introducing us to cleaning up pollution by turning it into paint. So welcome, Guy. All right, thank you. Am I going to get a screen on? All right, thank you all for coming. Uh, so yes, I'm an environmental engineer, and what that means is I use science and technology to clean up pollution. Uh, I'm gonna get into a little geology and a little chemistry here, but those are not my areas of expertise, and I know there's a lot of like really smart people out there, so the chemists out there, I, I apologize for everything I mess up. Um, I'm just using it to clean stuff up. All right, I want to start by thanking my collaborators, uh, John Sabra, an amazing artist, chair of art and design here at Ohio University, and uh, Michelle Shively, Sunday Creek Watershed Coordinator, works for Rural Action. Uh, she really understands the biology and the streams. Couldn't have done any of this stuff without the two of them. And then, you know, I'm going to talk about what I've done in the last 10, 12 years on this project, but really it's these guys who've done everything like graduate students and undergraduate students so uh, i can't name them all there's a couple out in the audience i see one or two that are currently working on this project um there's been lots that have that have made incredible contributions all right so my story starts 360 million years ago uh this is a picture of appalachia back then um, giant swamps with huge trees and all kinds of growth, uh, dragonflies the size of uh, birds, and uh, this is before the dinosaurs. And for about, I don't know, 60 million years, these trees, these giant trees grew, died, collapsed into the swamp, were buried, and accumulated, and accumulated. And and then I'm a little fuzzy what happened between then and now, but somehow they all get buried and pushed underground and pressurized and heated. And what happens to all that stuff that got buried, you think? Yes? It gets turned into coal. It gets turned into coal. Very good. So here's a big local rock that uh, we have a lot of this around here. Um, it's actually, so it's a rock, but it's a, it is a pure fossil, right? Like this is, this is basically a tree that's been turned into a rock. And if you think about the energy potential there, so this ecosystem was around, as far as I know, about 60 million years. So about 60 million years, the plants and the trees are collecting sunlight, turning that, using that energy and turning the carbon dioxide in the air into wood and then all of that got buried and accumulated. So we're now digging this stuff up the last couple hundred years. We've been digging it up and burning it, right? But it, it, it represents like 60 million years of solar energy all collected and stored for us. I mean, it's really amazing that we have access to this energy source. Um, but as you know, it's, it's had its consequences. Uh, there's still 1.1 trillion tons of coal underground. If we burn all of that, uh, temperature will probably rise about 18 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be catastrophic to the planet. Uh, it's enough to power the world for 150 years. In Ohio, we still get about 40% of our electricity from coal. It's a big problem. We have to figure out, so 1.1 trillion tons, somebody owns that, somebody wants to sell all that. We have to figure out a way to just keep that in the ground. Okay. So, 
So as I said, this is a rich energy source. It helped develop this region. It's one of the reasons people settled here in Athens, Ohio. Uh, to get that coal, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. What I'm going to talk about here are um, underground mining methods. And what's on the display here is a room and pillar mine. And this is, uh, what you're seeing is a map from an old mining company, and it's hand-drawn. We have tons of records of these, of these old mines from the 1800s, early 1900s. And, you know, they meticulously kept track of where they went because uh, they didn't want to die, right? They didn't want to go into a the wrong cavern and have a collapse or something. And the reason they tunneled this way, it's so strange. So they go down underground until they find the mine seam, so, or the coal seam. You can see this coal seam here on this picture. Around here, it's about 7 to 10 feet thick, something like that. And they find that seam, and then they just follow it. They go horizontally, but it actually dips down, so they, they go kind of diagonally downwards, and they follow this and pull out all the coal. But if they just took it all out, the whole uh, ceiling would collapse on them. So this is what they end up doing, and it's called room and pillar mining, and they have these tunnels with all these rooms off to the side, and they leave the walls in between those rooms deliberately just to hold up the roof, basically. So this was done extensively around here. Uh, there was also a lot of surface mining. For a time, this is what our neighborhood looked like. Maybe not Athens City, but locally in, in the region. And after they took all the coal, they gave it to the U.S. government and said, here you go. We took the trees, we took the coal, looks kind of like the moon, it's all yours. And that became the Wayne National Forest. So fast forward where we are now, it's grown back mostly, um, and we live in a gorgeous area. As you ride up 33 to Columbus, you go on that Nelsonville Bypass, you go through the Wayne National Forest, it's a gorgeous stretch of road, right? Uh, but you have to remember that there's this legacy of coal mining. Underneath all of that are these, these catacombs, these miles and miles and miles of old coal mine that have never been recovered, have never been sealed, have never been um, restored. So this is a map of underground mines in the area. So here's 33. This is going up to Columbus. Athens, city of Athens is down here. Here's Chansey. All of this yellow here, that's underground area that's been mined out underground. The, or the, the darker color is surface mining. So in Ohio, there's over 600,000 acres of underground mine. Uh, after they walked away, a lot of those caverns filled with water. And what happens when you take 360 million year old deposits and suddenly expose it to the atmosphere, basically? You suddenly expose it to water, and oxygen. Uh, we don't think about this, but oxygen is a very corrosive chemical. It's a very strong oxidant. If an alien came to this planet, they might, they might be like, oh my god, it's, it's going to kill me. It's, it's full of oxygen, this planet. I mean, it's a really, our body has all these mechanisms to deal with surviving an, ox, uh, an, an atmosphere that has oxygen in it. Um, it's a very strong chemical. So I'm getting to the sciency part of the science cafe. Um, so this, there's pyrite in the coal. This is the main, main problem that I'm focused on. So as I said, the coal, it's a rock, but it comes from a trees buried in a swamp. So it's, it's never pure. There's all kinds of stuff in here. One of them is pyrite, and it reacts with uh, oxygen and water. And what you result in is a lot of dissolved iron and sulfuric acid. And that's kind of what it looks like when it comes out of the mine. We've got hundreds of miles of stream in this area in southeast Ohio that are polluted with acid mine drainage, this, this water that comes out of the mine shafts. Uh, each one of those triangles is a AMD seep. It's a location where one of these mines is leaking out water. So you can see there's plenty of problems. Uh, where's Athens? I think, <laughs> I think we're covered up, right? I don't know. I can't even find it. 
Uh, this is a local seep. All right, so let me back up. It's disgusting. It kills fish. Uh, the acid in the water kills the fish, and also the sludge, that iron precipitate, it coats the entire stream. It, in some cases, it fills the stream entirely. That makes really bad habitat for our native biology. Like the fish, they can't hunt, they can't uh, mate, they can't lay eggs, they can't do all the things that they do. But it's also kind of gorgeous, right? Like if this, if you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, it's, it's an amazing national park. If this was in Yellowstone, there'd, there'd be like a, a walkway around it and people taking pictures, right? So I had heard that from another uh, technical presentation that someone was collecting this stuff and turning it into paint. So I did a little background work, and sure enough, iron oxide paints are one of the most stable, oldest paints that are uh, still in use today. Uh, the original cave paintings, uh, so this is the red in here is hematite, it's an iron oxide. <coughs> uh, iron can form a variety of different minerals, so you can get a variety of different colors out of it. And there's even this town in, oh boy, Sweden? I've forgotten where it is. Falun, Sweden, I think. Let's go with that. Does anyone know? No Swedes? <laughs> um, they have an old copper mine, and when I say old, more like uh, 1500, something like that. Uh, and it has acid mine drainage, and it has accumulated all of this sludge from the pollution, and they have collected it and turned it into a paint. And it's been so successful, it's, it's like, it's been designated the national paint of Sweden, if I have the right country. country. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, yeah, and they paint barns with it and such. So, can be done. Uh, in in China, we Im we import most of our paint, most of our iron oxide paint from China. It's made synthetically uh, in a in a facility that takes polluted water. They take wastewater from a steel manufacturing plant, and they pull the iron out of it and turn it into pigment and sell it. It's a giant market. Uh, we import 178,000 metric tons a year. So, here was my thought. What if we go to one of these polluted sites? This is in Corning, Ohio, this site. Um, about a million gallons a day of water, polluted water comes out of this hole. Uh, something like 20 square miles of connect, interconnected mine, all drains to this one spot. It then goes right into Sunday Creek here, and you can see the orange starting to precipitate already. What if we built a facility right there, captured the water as it came out of the mine, cleaned it so that the clean water was then going into the stream, and the iron that we take out of it, we can then sell it. Crazy, right? So I was really excited about this. Um, so I started playing around. Uh, this was like 15 years ago. And so here is acid mine drainage. It's not disgusting, right? It looks just like something out of the tap, right? But there's, uh, when it comes out of the mine, it's still anaerobic. It hasn't, uh, it hasn't reacted with the aerobic environment yet. So it's still like it's underground. And uh, in, when, you're, when you study, are we good? <laughs> okay. When you study pollution, you realize that a lot of the worst things are invisible, that you can't see them. So, all right. I also knew that it was really acidic. So my first thought was like, all right, let's raise the pH. So I'm going to add sodium hydroxide to this. Uh, for this, it's probably around three. 
And there you go. Now you can see the iron that was in that water. What's happened is uh, I've hydrolyzed the iron. So it's in a dissolved state, Fe2+. And just by raising the pH, adding the sodium hydroxide, I've produced this solid. So that color that you see, <clears throat> technically it's not a color, it's a suspended particle. And this would settle out and, I don't know, we, we could collect it. Uh, turns out the blue is not stable, so that was kind of a dead end. Um, but if you oxidize it, now I don't, it takes a long time for this to oxidize by oxygen. By, by the atmosphere. So I'm going to use a really strong oxidant. Does anyone know what this is? Can anyone? Hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide, right. What do we use this for? <coughs> Cleaning wounds. Right. So this is, most of our disinfectants are strong oxidants. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, bleach, uh, fluoride for our teeth. And the way these things work is uh, chemically they just, they're strong oxidants. They, they rip electrons off of things. So when this comes in contact with a pathogen or, or some sort of germ, it just rips an electron off of it and kills it. Okay? So that's what it's going to do here. So I'm going to pour this in here. And this is what oxygen does, uh, but this is much faster. And I don't know if you can see that, but it's gone from blue to orange. So again, uh, Science. <laughs> uh, we had uh, ferrous dihydroxide, which uh, is not stable in the atmosphere. It reacts with oxygen. And what happens is you're oxidizing the iron. You're taking, stealing an electron from this iron and converting it into FeOH3. OK, so that was kind of roundabout, but, but I don't know. I feel like kind of a magician when I can make it blue and then orange. So that's why I do that. But anyway. You can do that directly, and, and that's what I do in my process. I take the acid mine drainage. First step is to oxidize it. And you can get um, the iron to precipitate out to form a particle. You can't see it right now, but those are little particles floating around, and eventually those would settle out. Okay, that's that one. Yes. How are you making all these different colors? Science. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good question. So, and this is the one of the interesting things about iron. So uh, what I'm starting with, my pollutant is iron, and. I can turn the iron into a variety of different molecules. So in the first time, I turned it into this, which is blue. And in the next step, I turned it into this, which is orange. So it just goes to show that the chemical composition matters, that iron, the element, is just a building block for all kinds of things you can make with it. Okay, so I got to work on this. Yes, sorry. Can you clean it out? Like, as it's oxidizing, it doesn't stop. It's going to stay on this stage. Is it like Yeah, if you leave it out long enough, it will stop. All of the iron will come out. But typically what happens is the water goes into a stream, and then this goes on for 7, 10 miles before it's done oxidizing. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't really talk about that, but yeah, that's something we have to do. Yep. Yep. And that's that's why I really started with this one uh, in my in my research because I knew I was going to have to do that at some point. All right. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's still all kinds of, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, so, 
so when it settles out, is there uh, pure water on top, or is there uh, other stuff? And this process, I'm trying to get the water good enough so that uh, the stream is healthy. I'm not producing drinking water. I'm not producing ultra pure water. Uh, I'm getting the acid out, and I'm getting the iron out. Um, so yeah, there's, a, there's still a lot of stuff in there. Mostly uh, sulfate, uh, sodium, calcium, magnesium, chloride. Uh, yeah, mostly those, those are the main things that are still in there. And really high, co high enough concentrations of those that you wouldn't want to drink it. It would taste nasty. I just let it settle. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, I got to work on this, and I had within like a year all the glassware in my lab was orange. Um, I had you know bottle after bottle making this stuff, and I was very excited. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna make this stuff. I'm gonna get this gorgeous pigment. And inevitably, this is like what I ended up with, this like brown, nasty sludge. And I could not, I could not figure out, and you can see it right here, like that's worthless. That's, no one's going to paint anything out of that. Um, I could not sort out how to do that. So I had to go back to science uh, and, and start to really understand inorganic chemistry and, and iron and how it how it behaves. And it, it turns out, as someone asked earlier, that iron can form all kinds of different minerals. And, and, and that's what I'm doing here with this solid, this thing that's settling out, is I'm taking a dissolved chemical and turning it into a mineral. Uh, and as you can see, the, the ones that are, there's only a few that are of value, uh, magnetite, hematite, and girtite. And these, uh, you can see the different colors. These all basically have the same composition. They're all made of iron, oxygen, and hydrogen, um, but different combinations and different crystal structures as well. So I realized that, you know, I was, I was just sort of rushing through this, and I, I have to follow one of these strict pathways if I'm going to get anything of value. So I ran a whole bunch of experiments. Well couple graduate students ran a whole bunch of experiments. Uh, tubs of water, controlled temperature, controlled pH. Uh, we worked with bacteria. We did all kinds of crazy stuff. And at some point, we got, we figured out what were the, the important factors to create good pigment. And it was, it was a long process. It was not, it was not obvious. Uh, so here you can see, these are standard, these are called drawdowns. This is what the paint industry uses to test different paints. Uh, and I don't know if you can see with this lighting, but it started out awful, and then we get to something close to the standard GERT type. We did some more analysis. This is powdered x-ray diffraction. And this is a cool analysis. You, you put your sample in this machine, and it shoots x-rays at it, and it kind of like cycles around. And the way it reflects off of your sample tells you something about the mineral. So the red is pure gertite, what a pure mineral would look like. And this blue is my sample. And you can see it's like there's a terrible match. That's one of the horrible ones. But as I got better at this, you can see the blue line is, is starting to hit these peaks and starting to match better with the pure pigment. And this is, this is the pigment we're creating now, and it's got Good color. Uh, we've been working with the paint industry now. It's got good hiding power, and um, uh, I don't know. I can't remember the the terms they use. Okay. So I'm going to highlight some of John's work now. Uh, John is from the College of Art. He's an amazing artist. Uh, he started making his paintings out of the pigment we were using, and this is one that he made for me. And you can see there's uh, the yellow and the orange has been used in this. The green is, is commercial. We didn't make the green. We can't make green yet. Um, and I just want to highlight some of the stuff that he's accomplished. If you've been to the Athens Bakery, the mural there was painted by his students with our paint from acid mine drainage. So all that yellow and orange, that all came from a creek. 
And he did, I've never worked with an artist before, but he had all these, he was always coming up with these crazy ideas. I'm like, John, that's not going to work. I, we don't have time. He's like, no, no, let's just try it. So, so next thing I know, I've got all these different samples in the ovens and the furnaces going at different temperatures. And, and sure enough, when you heat up, this is our raw material that we get from the seep. But if you heat it up, you can get it to change form. So it goes, this is mostly gertite, and it converts into hematite if you heat it up high enough. And then he went, he went like as high, <laughs> as high as the furnaces would go, and it turned purple. And uh, we, we don't really know what that is still, but we're working on it. Uh, we've been working with a gambling paint company in Oregon. He barged into their production facility one day and wouldn't leave. And uh, next thing I knew, he, he um, had a relationship with the, with the floor manager, and we were sending them samples. And this is some of our paint that they made. Uh, we sent them pigment, we send them the powder, and then they turn that into an oil-based artist paint. Uh, they've done a bunch of testing for us. Uh, they uh, produced 500 tubes, which we gave away in a Kickstarter of paint. Uh, we, John also sent them to prominent artists around the world and is collecting works that were made by our paint. And recently, we just sent uh, 250 pounds of pigment to them for a, a real production line, so an actual line that they're going to sell. Whoops. Okay, so I can make it in jars. Uh, we, we've gotten a lot of press, and we're selling, we're soon going to be selling paint, but I still haven't like cleaned up anything. Right? Like I, I'm an environmental engineer. I started this whole thing because we have polluted streams in Athens, Ohio, and they're still polluted. So uh, two, about, about two years ago, I started this project that was funded with the sh by the Sugarbush Foundation and um, um, uh, uh, Richard Dickerson through a private donation. And uh, we s built a small water treatment plant in Corning, Ohio. Anyone been to Corning, Ohio? You heard of that? It's like, I don't know, 40 minutes north of here on Route 13. Great story. So uh, Michelle told me the story. They, they had, you know, the giant mine there, tw like 20, 30 square miles. All the water comes out at this one spot. They mined it in the late 1800s, early, I don't know, I guess about 1980? No, I don't know. 1950, maybe like 1950? I wish Michelle was here. She could do, she could do this part. Um, they decided they wanted to go back to the mine and, and get some more coal out of there. We have more efficient methods now. Uh, it's, it's profitable to, to do this, these remining operations, they call them problem was the mine was flooded and full of water. So what was their solution? They went right next to the river and they drilled a hole down into the mine to let all the water spray out. So they drained the mine cavity as much as they could and then they were able to go back and remine. So this is after they had drilled that hole. It actually, this is, this is maybe a year later. When they first drilled it, there was so much pressure that there was this giant geyser and they almost lost the drill rig, like down this hole, this giant hole that started forming from the, from the erosion. Uh, and it's been flowing ever since. So this is what it looks like now. This is the mine. So this is all acid mine drainage. It comes up out of this hole that's, I don't know, 50 or 60 feet deep. It comes up out of here, over a million gallons a day, 790 pounds of iron a day, and flows right into Sunday Creek. Sunday Creek is literally right there. So there's no, it's a very difficult place to treat, right? Because the water's going right in. This is actually in the city park. Uh, so I don't know if you can see it. This is from Google Maps. There's a little park here. It's, it's nice. Uh, 
And this is Sunday Creek. And I don't know if you can see, but it's like normal until you get to here. And then it's orange all the way down. Yeah. Uh, one of the guys, so when I was working here, I ran into someone who grew up there. And he said, yeah, when I, I used to play Little League in that field. And, you know, there was this geyser of polluted water over here. And then on the hillside across the road, there was an old slag pile that was on fire for about 20 years. So he's playing Little League, and there's this, I don't know, it's crazy. <laughs> Hillside's on fire. So we put in a small water treatment plant. This is when we got the first big tanks, and it's not all connected yet. Uh, and what this does is uh, we pump water out of the seep. We first run it through these aeration chambers or these, these aeration tanks. And just the splashing adds enough oxygen to the water to do that first reaction of oxidation. So that turns the clear water orange. Very exciting. Uh, it then goes into these two tanks. Uh, these are just reaction tanks, that, which allows time for the iron to oxidize. And then it goes into this settling tank, and you can see the orange water in there. That's where the iron settles to the bottom, and then clean water comes off the top and goes back to the stream. You can see the seep here, and we've got uh, a buoy holding up a, a pump that's pulling water out of there. So this. We're still operating this. It's actually down right now. We're going to start a new experiment soon. But we've been operating this for about two years. So this is our, our step from this to something that could actually clean up a stream. Again, this is not cleaning up anything. This only treats uh, half a percent of the flow. Um, it's a million gallons a day, that, that, that seep. That's a giant operation. And I, I also want, while I'm here, I want to point out, uh, you know, there's, John's always got an influence on our project. So even though this is just like a test water treatment plant, he came up with this awesome sort of like banner uh, enclosure around it. If you look at it in this direction, you get a description of the process. If you look at it in the other direction, you get a different, I don't know, it was really cool. And, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it works. The dissolved oxygen coming out of the seep is really low. After it goes through those splashing things, it's close to 100% dissolved oxygen. The iron is oxidizing well. At first, it's uh, 35, and by the end, it's down below 5. Uh, in our last run, we got it down closer to 0, which is what we're shooting for. We're still having trouble with the settling. The iron is not settling out. Uh, but I think that's an artifact of the, the small system that we're working with. We're going to run a test next week to try to sort that out. And we got some great pigment out of it. So this is, this is the first real pigment we've produced from a treatment process, from a process that can clean up the water. And John made a painting. OK. So the, the last thing I want to talk about, I think this is the last thing, uh, is, is taking this full scale. So we went from jars to that little pilot scale treatment plant, which is still, I don't know, still a few things to sort out. Um, but now we're going to tackle the true town seep. This is if you work in this area, this acid mine drainage in the region, this is like the big monster. This one is over a million gallons a day. The iron concentration is ridiculously high. Um, what did I say here? 7,200 pounds of iron are dumped into Sunday Creek every day through this hole. Think about that. That's like, it's at least, that's like two or three cars being junked into that stream every day for the last 40 years. And it's going to continue for the next, I don't know, 100, 200 years. At some point, it'll all flush out. But it's going to take a century or two for that to happen. Um, and this, this is in someone's backyard, actually, this one. 
Okay, and it kills seven miles of stream. It goes, so it goes into Sunday Creek. Sunday Creek goes for seven miles from there to the Hocking River. So the whole bottom seven miles of Sunday Creek is, is pretty much dead. I mean, there's, there's some things in there, but, but none of the good species, none of the things you, you want. It then goes into the Hocking River, and then this flows right through campus. So we've designed a full-scale system. This is the schematic for it. It's just a preliminary design. A, a real design for something like this would be you know, a stack of uh, uh, CAD drawings like this high. But we've done a preliminary design, a cost estimate. Uh, we're estimating it costs about seven and a half million to build this water treatment facility that would be on site, that would collect all of the water coming out of True Town, capture all of the iron from that, 7,200 pounds a day, and turn it into a pigment that we could sell. Um, recently, we were awarded three and a half million to start building this through the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and the um, US Mineral Resources something, something, something. Um, so we are, we are now, we have started. Uh, right now, me and my students, we're working on finalizing these plans so they can go out to bid so a real engineering firm can, you know, make that stack of documents we need to build something like this. Rural Action has bought this property. I forget how many acres, but we now own this land that's shown here. So we have the property, and next year they're going to start uh, moving the soil. Right now it's a, it's a pasture, but next year they're going to start moving the soil to change the grade so we can put a, a water treatment plant on it. All right, and this is, this is the key part. This is, what, this is why I started this. So Going back to the beginning, we have these polluted sites in Ohio. Why do we live with pollution? We're, we're in the United States. We have a very strong EPA. We have a strong environmental ethic. But we are in continual violation of the Clean Water Act in southeast Ohio for the last 40 or 50 years. And, and the reason is it's, it's expensive. It's really <laughs> expensive to clean this stuff up. And it's not killing anyone. It's just sort of degrading our lifestyle, right? It takes away recreational opportunities. It kills the fish. And um, if you've driven through Chansey, this, you know, Sunday Creek goes right through Chansey, and it's absolutely disgusting for that whole section, right? So why is it not being cleaned up? It's expensive, and um, I don't know. We don't have a lot of political clout, right? This changes that. It's, this is no longer expensive, or it could be if, if I can pull this off. This is no longer expensive. We now have uh, a market, something we can sell. Um, two, over two million pounds of pigment a year. It goes for, I can't remember, I think it's around 50 cents a pound. No, that's not right, 70, 75 cents a pound. Uh, that's sales of almost $2 million a year. I still have to operate the plant. There's a bunch of costs associated with that, and I think I probably lowballed that there. I think this is going to be more expensive to operate than I originally thought. But if you're selling pigment for $2 million a year, you can make that work. All of a sudden, something that was impossible because it was too expensive is now possible and maybe it might even turn into a business, right? Maybe we can even create jobs and a new sort of market for Southeast Ohio and all of Appalachia, really. On yeah. the production side of things, what gives um, 50 a competitive advantage? Would it be cheaper than a synthetically produced haze or are you hoping that people are environmentally mindful and will want to purchase this in the case of that, that it's a good yeah, that's a great question. I, 
Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so the question was, could you say that again? <laughs> Right, so, so what is the competitive advantage of this paint compared to others? Um, will people prefer this paint because if they're environmentally mindful? Um, so that was my thought. I was like, paint companies are gonna love this, right? They can, they can market this as a green paint, they can. Uh, but we went through a business development program and we, made 500 cold calls to paint companies and other people who might be interested in this product. And uh, the big paint companies, all they cared about is quality and cost. You know? Um, they, you know, when you tell the story, everyone's excited about the story. But the big paint companies, uh, they can't make that work. That's, that's not something that they see as valuable. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> it was frustrating. Yeah, but we can produce the same. So this is iron oxide pigments are a commodity. Uh, what did I say? 400 trillion tons a year. I mean, some ridiculous number. They go into yellow, red, black paints. Uh, they go into block. They go into concrete. They go into sometimes they use as fertilizer. Uh, all uh, a variety of other construction supplies. It's a giant industry, and it's just a commodity. So if we can produce something that meets the same quality standards, and so far we can, uh, we can sell it at the going rate of seventy-five cents a pound, and that's that's good enough to to achieve our goals. Mm. Yeah, I looked at that. It's not. It. Uh, they. That's not how they make. How they make iron. They start from a different source. And I didn't go too far on that. Interesting though. Uh, there's another pollutant around here. Aluminum. A lot of the mines around here also have a pretty high level of aluminum. And we can produce aluminum trihydroxide. So. Same basic chemical, just aluminum instead of iron. And that's how they make aluminum metal. That somewhere in the process, they actually start from bauxite, which is a, an ore, and then they, they do a bunch of stuff. And, and at some point in the process, they dissolve it in sulfuric acid and precipitate it out. And that's basically what's happening in our streams. So it's possible we could also do this with aluminum. Uh, I'm just at the jar stage with that, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, get the guy back there. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I'm terrible at that. Is the EPA doing anything to regulate this was the question. So uh, you know, the, these coal, mi coal mines were abandoned before there were regulations on the coal mining industry. Active coal mines now are, are pretty intensely regulated. Uh, if they have any water coming out of their mine, they have to treat it so there's no iron and no acidity coming out of it. Once they're done, they, they have to set aside a bunch of money to, uh, for the restoration as well. Although som sometimes they can get around that with bankruptcy and stuff like that, so that's a little fishy. But um, as far as the polluted water, so the Clean, the clean Water Act says, it says a lot, but in, in, in base, um, succinctly, it says that all of our surface waters should be drinkable and fishable. And you can talk, and they define a surface water basically as anything you can float a canoe on. Um, so we are in violation of the Clean Water Act right now. And uh, it is on Ohio EPA's radar for something to fix. 
but they just don't, they don't have the money to do it, you know. So Sunday Creek has been flagged as a, a site for restoration, and they're, they're working on it, but there's no technology out there that's affordable. Yeah. And Uh, are there plans to filter out anything besides iron at the True Town plant? We're, our plan is to take out the iron and uh, neutralize the acidity. That, that's basically it. We picked that site because it is, uh, there aren't many other metals in it. Um, there's a little bit of aluminum, a little bit of manganese. We will remove those as well, and they're actually going to... Um, be a impurity in our pigment, but they're low enough that it's not a it's not an issue. Uh, yeah. On your water treatment uh, plant, there, are you trying on just uh, natural aeration for forced oxidation, or just uh, water enough to kind of alkalize it? Is it going to precipitate? Is it relying on gravity, or do you have some kind of a bunch of static or some precipitation to get it out? Yeah, we're, so we're going as cheap as possible. We're using conventional water treatment technologies. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, so, so the question is, what, what are we using to oxidize the, the AMD, and, and what are we using to, to settle out the water, uh, to settle out the iron? So in this, this first set of tanks, these are aeration basins. And basically, we are, uh, we have, uh, shed with a blower in it that is blowing air into bubblers in these tanks. So that, yeah, yeah. And then we're removing the iron in these, uh, these clarifiers. So these are your standard circular clarifiers. When this is up and running, it's, it's going to look just like a wastewater treatment plant, basically. Um, y yes, yep, oh, <laughs> it is the property part of the infamous Chauncey floodplain. Yep, yep, so we have regraded it so that the plant is up above the flood level, uh, but we have more water storage down here in the surrounding areas, so that's, that's one of the challenges in, in building the plant is to uh, make sure the plant is safe, but we don't reduce any of the flood floodplain area. Yep. And in fact, we're going to convert. I mean, the Rural Action's got a lot of ideas for what to do with this property beyond just the plant. We're, so this, this sh is going to end up being a uh, developed wet, a wetlands system. So the question is, uh, just to confirm, after the pilot test, is the process ready for commercialization? Sure. <laughs> uh, so that the pilot process, we're still working on that. And so far, the real results have been pretty good. I'd like to get, we haven't been getting good settling. I'm working on that. So there's a few more things to iron out. Um, but. Yes, uh, the results we have indicate that the full-scale system is going to work. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question is, are there other uh, metals like lead that uh, are in the, in the water and might end up in the pigment, and what are we doing to strip those out of there? Yeah, there are. We've, we've done significant testing on all the seeps in the region, well, all the, the big ones in the region. Uh, you can't find toxic metals in the water at levels that are detectable. But when you produce the pigment, you can find it in the pigment. And we have found in at different locations, it's all different. But we, 
combined, we found things like lead and arsenic and uh, beryllium and uh, cadmium. Um, yeah, but manganese, yeah, manganese. Um, things that are, that are toxic at certain levels. So far, the testing that we've done has shown that they're below toxic levels, below action levels for a pigment. Uh, when you compare our pigments to other pigments on the market, you know, sometimes they're mined for, sometimes they're produced synthetically, they all have similar levels of, of metals as well. So, yeah, there's, there's some nasty things in there at really low levels, but apparently it's in all our paint, so. I wouldn't recommend it for cosmetics, for example, but I think it's, it's, it is comparable to, to the market. Yeah. Yeah, True Town is on the map. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so the question was, is True Town a real, a real town? And uh, what a great marketing name. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you doing anything to clean up the stream bed from the settled up stuff that was falling out early in the process? The question is, are we doing anything to clean up the stream bed? Uh, we haven't gotten there yet. So our understanding, our expectation is when we get this up and running and we divert all the pollution, we collect the pollution and we're releasing clean water into the stream, it will only take uh, a few years of flood events to flush all that out and, and restore the stream. I, we don't know, but that's our expectation. Uh, it, it, it would be, once, once we've done this, cleaning up the stream bed would be relatively easy because we've cut off the source of the pollution. Yeah. We have a question over there. Yes. Do you have any plans to work with like mining companies directly to get it at the source of where that disposal bed stream? The question is, do I have any plans to work with mining companies directly to get it, to get the pollution before it gets to the streams? Yeah, we, we called a bunch of mining companies, and they were all like, uh, I wish you long hairs would stop calling and, and messing with us. Uh, we got a couple of those. We, we, we couldn't get any traction with the mining industries. I, I think, so I, I was really surprised because the active mines, the, these mining companies that have active mines, they have giant ponds that they're collecting water and uh, precipitating out iron and adding lime to it to, to prevent the pollution from spreading outside the mine. So they have expensive operations that they're continually taking care of. But I, I think it's, it, this was just too crazy. Like, it, it's, not their, it's not their business. It's not their industry. You know, it's, it, they weren't, the people that we talked to weren't comfortable even thinking about it. It's just, it's not what they do, you know, and I don't know, maybe if we can make progress at one site and demonstrate it, we can change that, but I don't know. Last question? Yes. So with the prevention process that you had, what were you planning on doing with the Ah, good question. So the question is with the projected profits of the plant, what are we expecting to do with them? Uh, I'm going to Costa Rica. Um, so the, as I said, this property was bought by Rural Action. Uh, we're partnering with Rural Action right now. And when we move forward, Rural Action is going to own the plant. They're a nonprofit. Um, the, we haven't drawn up the formal agreement yet because it's too early. But the plan is that Profits from this will go into restoration of streams. Uh, the intent is that initially, like with this first plant, profits from this, well, well, first we have to pay off the loans and all of this, right? But the profits 
will go to building another one somewhere else. Because So I've talked about the profits, but we still have to spend $7 million to build this thing, right? So um, there, there's still that sort of financial hurdle. We were funded generously by uh, a, a, a federal agency who's interested in pollution cleanup, but they're not going to keep doing that over and over again. Okay, well, let's thank uh, Guy for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Sure, he'll be around to answer any questions people have got remaining. I've got one last announcement, and that is our next Science Cafe is next Wednesday. It'll be Felipe Rosa Vera. He'll be discussing interconnected network societies, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so I thank you for att attending. Thank you.